Good morning, Dennis. Thank you very much. I must say it's a pleasure and honor to be here today uh, with such an eminent group of people to discuss the uh, uh, the heritage and the and the implications of the work of Vladimir Vernadsky. <clears throat> it's of the utmost importance in this particular period as we begin to, to revive the heritage of the great Russian-Ukrainian science scientist Vladimir Ivanovich Vernadsky at a time when certain forces here in the West, uh, anxious to maintain control over a bankrupt financial system, are preparing to divide the world into two warring parties, uh, even at the risk of, uh, of causing nuclear war. It is also important to note the work of this proudly Russian scientist with deep Ukrainian roots in order to underline uh, the fact that these two nations and these two peoples uh, have been united culturally and in other ways in a very complex relationship for over a thousand years and more. In the present climate of canceled Russian culture, Ukrainians are in danger of losing an important element in their cultural heritage, including the pioneering work of, of Vladimir Vernatsky, uh, who helped to found the, the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences at the end of the First World War, often over the objections of those who desired a total Ukrainianization of the process. The name of Vernatsky is not unknown in the United States, particularly in scientific layers, but little is known uh, of the real nature of his thought. A limited number of writings of Vernatsky were introduced into the US by people who had a diametrically opposed view to his conception of man and man's role in the world. For most people, Vernatsky uh, is simply viewed as some kind of early environmentalist. While some of Vernatsky's writings had been published in the US prior to his death in 1945, including an important testament of sorts in the January 1945 uh, issue of Scientific American, it was not until 1970 with the publication of an issue of Scientific American dedicated to the biosphere that Vernadsky's name again appeared prominently in American publications. The publication of this particular issue of Scientific American was the clarion call for the creation of the Malthusian environmentalist movement of the 1970s. In that sense, uh, Vernadsky was introduced, in that issue, Vernadsky was introduced to the American public by one G. Evelyn uh, Hutchinson, a British ecologist teaching at Yale, who later became one of the founders of the 1970s zero growth movement. In 1947, Hutchinson had written an article entitled, entitled On Living in the Biosphere. In it, he wrote, the population of the world is increasing, its available resources are dwindling apart from the ordinary biological processes involved in producing population saturation already known to Malthus. The current disharmony is accentuated by the medical sciences, which have decreased death rates without altering birth rates and by modern wars, which one may suspect put greater drains on resources than on population. Terrible as these conclusions must appear, they have to be faced. So much for Hutchinson. Now let's hear Vernadsky's views on Malthus's predictions. Malthus doesn't realize that this fundamental results lead to entirely different conclusions. You might say that they're simply not true because he did not take into consideration the fact that estimating accurately the long-term growth of human population geologically as regards food and the necessities of life, the expansion of plant and animals comprising it um, must inevitably increase with greater force and speed, expressing a more rapid rate of reproduction than that of the population. It is necessary to always have this correction in mind. Historically, it is only the irrational elements in our social system that make it difficult to clearly observe the effect of this natural phenomenon. So why was the Malthusian Hutchinson the one to present Vernadsky to the English-speaking world? 
No doubt it was his friendship with uh, Vernatsky's son, George, who was together with him at Yale University, George, a professor of history, and he working in the uh, area of ecology. Hutchison had also helped George have a couple of Vernatsky's work on, works on biogeochemistry translated uh, or published in English, which George himself had translated in US ac academic journals. Later, when Vernadsky's early study entitled The Biosphere, which concentrated on rev the revolutionary, his revolutionary views on the role of living matter in transforming the inert matter of the earth, it was soon lauded as a Bible of the early, and early environmentalists. In fact, the real Vernadsky was not revealed to the English speaking world until his real view of man in the, uh, in, in the universe, until the seminars of Mr. LaRouche in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. While LaRouche had some knowledge of Vernadsky during the 19th, a period of intense studies after his service uh, in the CBI theater during World War II, uh, it really was not until the 1970s that he began to understand the depth of the man's thinking uh, and understand, began to understand this notion of uh, Vernadsky's uh, idea of the noosphere which was a term Vernadsky used to describe the era in which scientific thought begins to take the dominant role in shaping the biosphere, as Mr. LaRouche had indicated. In his own unique contributions to physical economy, LaRouche had pointed to the scientific discovery and its implementation in the form of technological innovations in the economy as the central factor uh, in, in economic production, which allowed mankind to reproduce itself at ever higher levels, which is wholly consistent uh, with Vernadsky's views as Vernadsky's views were indicated in his quote on Malthus. For LaRouche, continued economic development was wholly contingent on these discoveries, allowing man to leapfrog, as it were, to higher stages of development. Over the many thousands of years of human development, this was characterized uh, in energy by ever more dense forms of energy, uh, from sunlight to fire, to coal, to oil, and to nuclear power. Increasing energy flux density, as LaRouche called it, was a fundamental characteristic of the progress uh, of man and the strongest argument against the modern day Malthusians and their limits to growth. Vernadsky's view dovetailed completely with this concept. Uh, Vernadsky received his education at St. Petersburg University with teachers like the great chemist Dmitry Mendeleev, who developed the periodic table, uh, and Vasily Dokachayev, who's known as the father of soil sciences. Uh, the, there, the sciences were not only being taught, they were actually in the process of being developed. So this was a tremendous ferment going on at that time in Russian science. During his career, Vernadsky would make major breakthroughs in, in such fields as crystallography, mineralogy, hydrology, and geochemistry, as well as writing extensively about the history of science uh, and the history of Russian science. He can well be considered uh, the founder of the science of biogeochemistry. Um, he was the first, in fact, he was the first in the world uh, to have a biogeochemical laboratory, which began investigating along the lines uh, that he had pointed out. In 1910, Vernadsky was convinced that the world was entering the age of atomic energy. And in 1911, he organized an expedition to search for radioactive ores uh, in the Russian empire. In 1921, he established the Radium Institute in St. Petersburg. While working in Ukraine in the chaotic situation following the First World War, where the so-called allies were working to dismantle both Germany and the toppling Russian empire, Vernadsky, after a long period of illness with typhoid, made his first major breakthrough. This was the discovery that life, or what he termed more concisely living matter, far from being simply a phenomenon distinct from non-living matter, and even less uh, an, uh, a byproduct of non-living matter, a thesis which he totally rejected, represented an independent and powerful force 
which in fact on the atomic level interacted and transformed the inert matter it came into contact with. And the rapidity with which life reproduced itself, even in areas in which it previously had not existed, indicated to Vernadsky that the biosphere, the realm of life, was one of the most important forces on Earth. Indeed, perhaps even in the galaxy. In addition, Vernadsky believed that living matter only came from living matter, contradicting the then predominant theory of abiogenesis, the idea that life proceeds from non-life. Furthermore, Vernadsky <clears throat> was very much taken by the discovery of Louis Pasteur of chirality in living matter, uh, whereas uh, in, in chirality is the uh, uh, disymmetry in, in living matter, which you do not find in, the, in, in uh, non-living matter. Working in the 1920s for several years with Marie Curie at the Curie Institute in Paris, Bernatsky also acquired an interest in a study that was being done, uh, that had been done by the then deceased uh, husband of Marie Curie, Pierre, Pierre Curie, concerning the nature of this disymmetry or chirality that Pasteur had found in living matter. Curie began working on this in the last years of his life before his untimely death in a car accident and characterized the phenomenon more specifically as a different state of space than that of non-living matter. This indicated to Vernadsky that the geometry of Euclid was wholly unsuited to explain this type of phenomenon. And he began to confer with Russian mathematicians uh, regarding the possibility of using some form of Riemannian geometry uh, to explain or to as a framework for this type of phenomenon. This was another issue that sparked the interest of LaRouche, who also in economics, in his own view of economics, emphasizing the leaps of technology, the discontinuities, you might say, also drew the conclusions that this required a Riemannian framework in order to understand it fully. During his visits to Russia in the 1990s, uh, as a, in one hand, as a type of track two discussion on behalf of the Clinton administration, uh, and then in the in the 2000s uh, on his uh, on the invitation of Russian colleagues, uh, this became one of the topics. This issue of the uh, disymmetry and the need for following up in the study of these uh, alternative states of space uh, in this, the lectures he gave on Vernadsky uh, and economics. In 1920, 2001, he authored the book, The Economics of the Noosphere, which elucidated his thinking on these matters. But what was Vernadsky's sense of the noosphere? In contrast to the French Jesuit, Teilhard de Chardin, who used this concept in a theological sense, Vernadsky's notion was entirely this worldly. As Vernadsky saw it over the last five centuries from the age of exploration uh, to the modern age, uh, the 20th century, Mankind had, like life, extended his reach over the entire globe. Through technological progress, based on the creative processes of the mind, he had transformed the world around him, increasing the flux of energy in the biosphere, making it more productive. And as with the uh, legend of Prometheus, where Prometheus stole fire from the gods and uh, was chained to uh, a rock for all eternity, uh, the real story is, is probably much different, but is also extremely significant. Uh, as Vernadsky uh, explained the notion of the discovery of fire in a dissertation in 1938 entitled Scientific Thought as a Planetary uh, Phenomena, he says, it seems as if Homo sapiens or as close as predecessors appeared not long before the onset of that glacial period or in one of its warmer episodes. Man survived the severe cold of that period, possibly due to the great discovery that had been made in the Paleolithic age, the mastery of fire. That discovery was made in one, two, or possibly more places um, and slowly spread among the peoples of the earth. Uh, it seems that we're dealing here with a general process of great discoveries in which it is not the mass action of mankind smoothing over and refining the details, but rather the uh, the expression of separate human individuals. As we'll later see, we can track this phenomenon more closely in very many cases nearer to our own era. 
the discovery of fire presents the first instance in which a living organism takes possession of and masters one of the forces of nature. Undoubtedly, uh, Vernadsky continues, this discovery lies, as we now see, at the uh, foundation of mankind's subsequent future increase and of our present powers. Later, Vernadsky would add another uh, phrase, the action of that force scientific thought exerts a profound and powerful influence on the course of the Earth's energetic phenomena and consequently must undoubtedly have reverberations, albeit less powerful, beyond the Earth's crust in the existence of the planet itself. That force is the intellect of man directed and organized through the volition of man in his social existence. Bernaski saw this development as a new and higher phase in the development of the biosphere, where the mind of man or scientific thought itself becomes a geological force. Indeed, the predominant geological force in the biosphere. By the time of Vernadsky, that force uh, had already reached the, uh, the lower limits of the stratosphere in the development of the airplane and aerostatic devices and had penetrated to the lower granite levels of the earth. And knowing the works of Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, one of the early space pioneers, whom Vernadsky characterized as a new Columbus, he foresaw that man would soon be going into cosmic space. If he did not find life elsewhere in the cosmos, which Vernadsky firmly believed he would, he would nevertheless bring the bi biosphere with him, expanding the biosphere by means of the noosphere. The vision of Vernadsky is not an isolated pipe dream, but represents, as he characterized it, an elemental natural force. But since it takes place in the noosphere and is not merely the blind action of the biosphere, it is dependent on the creative action of man to bring it to realization. But the preconditions are already here for man to begin realizing a world in which those old elements that have been plaguing us for so long, namely poverty and disease, can be ultimately overcome. As Vernadsky stated in his last unfinished and untranslated work, the chemical structure of the biosphere and its surroundings, he said, is becoming clear and is entering uh, into man's consciousness that we now have before us the real possibility where we need no longer tolerate malnutrition and famine, poverty, or weakened physical conditions making people unable to withstand disease and can expand to the maximum degree, to the maximum degree human life. But the battle for realizing this new future for humanity is far from over and will continue perhaps for some generations, but it inevitably, inevitably is coming to light as an elemental process in the realization of the noosphere. These words were written in the 1940s with a view that the world would end with the victory of the allies. One, almost two generations have passed since these words were written. Now a new generation is faced with a situation in which mankind stands on the edge of a precipice, facing again, as in the early 1960s, the danger of a conflict between nuclear powers. To avert that danger, the world must turn to the view of Vernadsky and bring our nations together to realize the common aims of mankind. As Lyndon LaRouche urged his Russian colleagues during his visit to Moscow, uh, and the ideas associated with Vernadsky's conception of biosphere and noosphere will provide a needed added guidance for new global forms of cooperation among sovereign commonwealths. We must move in that direction with all due speed, and it is hoped that making the world more acquainted with the work of this great Russian scientist will help us to move in that direction. Thank you. <laughs>